Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. A request to you to watch this video till the end and also to like this video. And if you have not subscribed to our channel, do subscribe to our channel. I am standing in front of a beautiful temple with very high and exquisitely carved gopuram. Now, why am I choosing this topic? Well, I am going to talk about why the Brahmins are hated so much in Tamil Nadu. Now, there is a context to this, there is a story to this, and I am going to go back all the way up to the 10th century to tell you how things were then and how things are today. Today, population wise, if you look at Tamil Nadu, less than 1% is Brahmin. Everybody has left. I left in the 60s. Many others have all left because they just could not ply their trade there. You could not get into colleges, you could not get into many professions and in fact there were rules laid down that prohibited Brahmins from even applying. So I am going to also talk to you about an article that appeared in New York Times in 1982. This was an interview with a person who happened to be a Brahmin based in Chennai and he had just started or he was part of a Brahmin Youth Association. So I am going to talk about that also. But you need to understand what the problem is and with, you have to look at it with your eyes open and mind open and ears open. I am not going to try and justify anything here. I am going to tell you the way how things evolved from my research. And, and feel free to comment if you disagree with me on a specific uh, portion of this and I am all ears to listen to and we can keep talking about this. So let's first start with atrocities against Brahmins. Remember that Brahmins never took up arms. They could not fight. Even if he gave him a knife, a sword, whatever, he just couldn't fight. They were never intended for that. What did the Brahmins do? The Brahmins were the protectors of Sanatana Dharma. So now you understand the big picture. You, you take out the nucleus, the whole thing collapses. That is why the hatred against Brahmins. It wasn't like this before. There were other reasons why this hatred developed. And I'm going to go through all that stuff. So fasten your seat belts. This is going to be one heck of a ride. Here we go. So who is a Brahmin? Because we need to define the word Brahmin. Okay. We all know Brahma, who is the creator. We all know Brahman, which is the life force. The Om is one of the life force. Because what is Om? I have told you this before. The sound of the energy that reaches the earth from sun. You can't hear it in normal audible range, otherwise you would not be able to do anything. That will be always all pervading. But the Rishis could. So if you bring down the sound of the energy of sun to our hearing range, it would sound exactly like Om. And if you want to understand what Brahman is, there are many meanings. So um, you can interpret this in many ways, but one easy way to do it is Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara. Guru Sakshat Parabrahma Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha. So this is, is describing the Guru. Guru is Sakshat Parabrahma. That is, he is God. Parabrahma is, is the God. He had faceless, uh, nameless. Parabrahma had no face, no shape, no form. Which is why all these different murtis came along. right? So if you think of Parabrahma, then you have the Brahman and Parabrahman, above all these Brahmans. So this is a life force that sustains you and, and there is a big, bigger life force that sustains the whole universe. That's one way to look at Parabrahma. Okay? Now a Brahmin is not by birth. He's a learned person. This is very important to understand guys. It was not born. It may have become like that because after some time, because of all the invasions and everything else, people tended to learn what their parents were following. Even today, how many places do we see the sons of lawyers becoming lawyers themselves, the sons of doctors becoming doctors themselves, engineers, same thing. So this is something that has been there for a while because first of all, it is familiarity. You kind of know because it, it's around you. you, you grow up around it. So perhaps it's easier to imbibe. Whatever it is, this has been going on for a long time and it is not just something that, uh, you know, is unique to India. Caste, discrimination, all these things are there all over the world. To single out India is very, very unfortunate. Now, this is the article 
November 3, 1982, written by William Stevens as a special to New York Times. Brahmins, he is spelling Brahmins in a slightly different way. I like to do it as B-R-A-H-M-I-N-S because it, it sort of makes it clearer, separates it from the Brahman. Brahman, Brahmin. So I, I, I just wanted to kind of uh, separate that. That's why I like to uh, call a Brahmin as a Brahmin with an I rather than a A, which is okay. These are all variations. Now, in southern India, Brahmins, traditionally India's most literate, cultured and respected class, faced persecution, bigotry, scorn, vilification and discrimination in employment and education. You will laugh if I tell you when all this started. 1920s. As way back as the 1920s, there was discrimination. My grandfather had a master's in mathematics. That's like, you know, having a PhD in engineering or something like that today, or even bigger than that. There were only four graduating students from the entire Madras presidency. He was one of them. The other three were Caucasians, meaning like white, British and others. So you can imagine what a, an exclusive club he belonged to. The whites wouldn't hire him and the Chennaiites wouldn't hire him because all the people who were running banks and other industries, they were all not Brahmins and there was an anti-Brahmin wave. Why? Justice Party had been founded a few years ago and this was raging across Chennai. So he had to go and seek employment in a different state. I mean, this, this is 100 years ago. So I'm, I'm not making any excuses or any kind of apologies here as to how things came to this. But that was a situation 100 years ago. So there has been a steady migration out of Tamil Nadu of all Brahmins and, and this has been going on for a long time. Today, whoever is left, they are either small scale industries, they're running their own industries, uh, shop owners, lawyers, chartered accountants and so on, where you don't need to uh, you know, go and apply somewhere and get interviewed and also some sportsmen and even that is under attack now. So this is how things are and I'm going to take you back to way back, way back to the 10th century in, in the course of this conversation. So stay tuned because you have to understand what really happened. So this is 1982. This article is sort of like an interview with a person who had started the Youth Brahmins Association in Chennai in 1982 and he was talking about what has been happening. There has been a lot of baiting that had started all the way back during Periyar's time, that is E.V. Ramasam and Aikar. That baiting was, you know, uncontrolled. Then they would be targets of crude jokes and more threatening remarks. We will not rest until the last sacred thread had been ripped apart, said a scrawl on a Madras bridge. This is in 1982. Another scrawl on a wall. If you happen to see a snake and a papan together, kill the papan first. This was given by a poet called Bharati Dasan. I mean, he said he is a disciple of Bharati, Bharati Dasan, but he was a Dravida Karaham guy. And, and he used to write literature like this. The word papan is actually an unflattering term for Brahmin. The, no, the tongue wouldn't twist easily, so they made it papan, just flattened it out. Now, anyone, politics is about trying to identify your enemy. And it was very easy for those days politicians, and even today, right? Even today, and I'll tell you why even today this is this holds good. You gain votes, or so they think, by using Brahmins. The then governing party in Tamil Nadu came to power on an anti-Brahmin platform. This is the Dravida Munetra Karaham. So I'm going back and forth here a little bit, but just see how things led up. This is in 1982 and it has actually gotten worse now. For example, the EWS scheme, economically weaker sections of the society, they are supposed to get 10% reservation. You know what the DMK government said? It said we will not implement EWS because it will benefit the Brahmins. Aren't they human beings? Where is your social justice? Social justice is a oxymoron as far as DMK is concerned. That's all I can tell you. These guys are nothing but fervent haters. And, and having seen that hating Brahmins is not giving yielding dividends, now they are going and trying to hate the entire Sanatana Dharma. So you get this thing, right? We have been saying this for a long time at P Gurus. It will be first Brahmin, remember, Brahminical Patriarchy, 
which uh, you know that that fool from Twitter then Jack Jack held up without understanding what he was holding up and then that became a big viral thing till today he's not said I'm sorry I didn't know the implications of what I was holding up well you know this is this is it I mean you can put anything you want in appreciation of whatever it is but some of these things have consequences not only that you couldn't even get into many of the jobs in, in government right from the 60s this uh, this persecution of Brahmins especially forward caste is so acute that you needed to get 90 percent or about this is 1982 today it is like 100 percent and even then you are not guaranteed even then you are not guaranteed go back and listen to some of the uh, lectures that uh, professor rv has given on p gurus about the the plight of the forward caste all this is because they were a small percentage according to this statistic it was three and a half percent it is my contention today and it is less than one percent in fact the caste survey of bihar has come out how much is the percentage of brahmins in bihar 3.6 percent only few states have uh, brahmins in in like a high single digits or maybe low two digits that's it maybe maybe karnataka i think is barely 10 percent and I think Uttarakhand may be a little bit high and I think Uttar Pradesh also has a little bit of Brahmin. That's about it. So this marginalized community is still being persecuted. People want to still keep giving reservations, but they don't want to give any help to the Brahmins. I'm talking about Tamil Nadu because economically weaker sections also are not being implemented there. It is considered uncertain at best. Now, all these things, I mean, th this is this article, if you read, you'll understand the whole intent and purpose of this uh, to, to see where things are going. But I wanted to take you back, back a thousand years. How were things in like the 10th century? Because today he is a vilified person. And how did this happen? I'll come to that. We started 10th century and work our way forward all the way up until 1916 when the Justice Party was formed, right? So here we go. In 10th century, there is an inscription in a place called Virupuram, which is about 150 kilometers south of Chennai. And there is a Vedic college, establishment of this Vedic college. Ennairam, Ennairam means a thousand thoughts, is a village in South Arcot district in Virupuram. The village was a Brahmadeya, Brahmin settlement, established by Raja Raja Chaturvedi Mangalam. Raja Raja is the name of the Chora king, one of the greatest ever. And he was the one who built the Brahadisura temple. Remember that, right? So this is, I'm quoting it from Dr. R. Nagaswamy. The book is called Tamil Nadu, the land of Vedas. And here he has gone directly back to the inscriptions. He is not uh, basing this story on some other book. That is not the reference. He's going straight to the stone inscriptions. And here it says, the village is therefore called Brahmadesam because it had, this was built primarily to make a Vedic university. It has a Vishnu temple in the center of the village called Raja Raja Vindnagar or Raja Raja Vishnu Graham. The main deity inside the sanctum is Narasimha, which was called Maha Ghora Swarupi. Maha Ghora Swarupi. Remember Ghor Ninda, same, same word. It is, it is actually a Sanskrit word, right? Mahagora Swarupi. There are four types of Narasimha Murti images that could be installed for worship. Here we are getting some gyan from the good professor. There are four Bhoga Murti, Yoga Murti, Ghora Murti, and Abhisharika Murti. Okay. In this case, it was the Ghora Murti that was installed, which is called in the record as Rajendra Sora Mahagora Murti an extremely ferocious form that would confer unimaginable victories. Now, why am I saying this specific temple? And I'll come to that in just one second. I just, let me read this one paragraph. True to its nature, the deity conferred the greatest of victory on Rajendra Chora, who could conquer territories up to the Gangetic Plains. The grateful Rajendra brought the Ganges water on the heads of the vanquished kings to this temple and placed it before the deity and worshipped the god. Can you imagine 12, 15 kings all marching towards uh, Virupuram 
in in a row carrying uh, ganga in their heads and then and rajendra performed the abhishekam in this temple now if you go back and uh, as part of this he orders to have a vedic college built here for 270 students and and they they are there are 75 students for rigveda 75 for yajur and and so on and so forth it just goes on the total of 275 students and all these people are allocated sometimes 25 to a teacher sometimes even as less as 10 to a teacher and all these things are provided by the king the king never um, asked these people to pay taxes because they were the custodians of the vedas and this was an attempt by the king rajendra sora to make sure that these traditions continue you see what happens is there is a there is a thriving uh, language need even today called bhashangam bhasha angam that is language you, you have to try and find the branches of it try to break it up into smaller parts sanskritam is such a nuanced and advanced language that the same word means different things depending on all the surrounding words so that bhashangam is a continuing operation millions of texts written in sanskritam hasn't changed over thousands of years it has still not been deciphered fully many of them are lying around in various places especially in kerala you will find a lot of these things but nobody has really taken the pains to put together what exactly it means because it's not possible to do it in a day what i'm trying to tell you is that this was how the king had established this college so a brahmin typically was somebody who learned these things anybody who learned this thing became a learned man a scholar and it was not only one particular community that benefited from this anybody could go and learn there now i'm going to give you another thing here there is um this was on page 338 and i am going to go to page 403 the choras ruled inland administration with velalas velalas is a name of a community and these were the people who actually were the administrators of the um the land that they managed these are the land administrators they like the collector district collectors if you will you know 70% of this officers of this department were velalas that is sudras that means 70% of the revenue management collection everything was done by sudras so where is the question of uh, you know discriminating against them it was not there in 11th century and it also goes on to say about 15% of them belong to cheftian's family and only about 14% of the entire lot were brahmins who were also doing the same thing see it depends upon where you are located if you are around place where a lot of brahmins were there you collected taxes from there and those people were there as uh, as tax tax collectors but to to say that they were oppressed forever is a bald lie there never was something like that so this is the situation in the 10th century right now now let's come up forward what happened now around uh, 1498 if i remember correctly vasco da gama comes to india and you know lands in uh, goa and then the portuguese are the first ones to try and wage wars and actually start establishing forts one on the west coast one on the east coast they had one in what modern day chennai uh, and one in uh, west coast near goa and then they also went to other places i'm not going to go into that the last to arrive were the british the portuguese came the spanish came the french came and then came the british there were the dutch somewhere here in the mix also now by the time the the british came uh, everybody else had already set up some things but the british had to go and fight to even just survive even to go and trade with various kingdoms now what they did was since they were the late comers they were more aggressive they said that look we are going to bring the best cloth ever made in uh, england and and we need to be able to protect this thing so can we have some big uh, buildings that we could build we'll build it you don't have to do anything you just need to give us a small plot of land where we can build these forts where we will keep all our merchandise also we don't go back immediately we have to wait for 6 months so whatever we are buying from you also 
we want to come and keep it here. This is like our storage place. And the king said, okay, fine, you can have a storage. So they gave some land because the Hindu kings were always welcoming. Remember in the second century, Christians arrived in India, second century. And we don't even know when the Jewish Jews arrived. So every time a new religion came, they were treated with respect and they were given sanctuary. They could do whatever they want and it was never stopped. So the British started building buildings. So they had, they constructed the Madras fort. I think that was the first one to come up. I could be wrong. It might be Kolkata, but it's not important. I want to stay with Tamil Nadu and the narrative around here, right? So they come and they built these forts. And then when the forts were built, then they said, well, you know, there are valuable in articles here. Uh, we, we have to be able to defend ourselves. So we also need permission to be able to store arms and ammunition. When the king said yes, they committed a fatal blunder because up until then, India was only fighting with bows and arrows and spears and shields. There was no gun. But by 14th, end of 14th century or early 15th century, you had cannons invented by a Romanian engineer. And uh, so the whole of Europe was getting into firearms, pistols and so on and so forth. So once the kings gave them permission to have arms there, then the British had their tail up. The British started systematically eliminating others. The Portuguese were limited to a small place. The Spanish were more or less driven out. And, and the Dutch also not much. The French hung, hung around for a while because the French at some point of time, they were powerful, more powerful. Their navy was more powerful than the British. And they used to be having all these wars on the seas also. The French hung around. You have Pondicherry even today to remind you of that. But mainly let us stay with the British because they were the ones who essentially conquered uh, India, right? We know that. So then slowly and steadily what happened was the British needed to trade, right? They could not speak the local language and there were many languages spoken in and around uh, uh, Chennai, what, what used to be called Madras Patinam at that time. So what they would do was they would seek out people who could speak in the local language as well as in English. These were called Dvibhashi, people who can speak two languages. It's colloquialized to Dubashi. Now, there were a lot of people who became extremely wealthy being this. They call Dubashi and I'll give you some examples, right? These are people who are iconic names today. Etiraj, there's a college after him. Pacheyappa, another one, college after him. Then there were people who, uh, who could pay a certain amount of money to the British and could have the entire street named after them. People like Tambuchetti. Lingichetti. These are names. Even today, you can go to Old Madras, you will find these streets. They were, they were bought. The names were bought by these Dubashis. And in the Dubashis also, there were a lot of Brahmins. You had every mix in that. The Tambuchetti, Lingichetti are Chetiyars. And, and Etiraj and Pachayapa, um, Pachayapa, then uh, many others are all Mudaliyars. Mudaliyars are also Velalars. My point I am trying to make is, there were many Dubashis also. And they were all one of the earliest natives to enrich from the trading. I mean, they would always, you know, give the highest price they can probably get away with uh, the British, quote the highest price to the British, quote the lowest price to the seller, who was probably a weaver in Kanchipuram, and make the differential. <clears throat> the British knew it, but what could they do about it? The same thing with French too. Many people became French to local language translators too. So, as this thing happened, as the British became more and more powerful, and once 18th century ended and 19th century came along, then the British started observing a little bit more keenly. They started getting more and more land. They had by that time defeated the Marathas. So they were poised to take over the entire country. And that's when Macaulay happened. Because up until then, even at the worst raids by the Mughals, they never went and disrupted the education system in India. That had helped the same. Whether it was Kanyakumani or Kashmir, Atak to Katak, everywhere you had these Gurukuls. Gurukuls were a common. And in Gurukuls, I told you, right, all the Veda students, Rig Veda, Yajurved, everybody had to mandatorily learn and read and master three things. Ramayana, Mahabharata and Bhagavatas. Because they said that if you understand all these three, 
you have everything you need as a life lesson. You'll be able to uh, lead life normally. So this was how the Gurukuls were established. And, and Gurukuls were based on the language at the in the local area. In other words, if you look at some of the art writings that is called A Beautiful Tree. This is a, an anthology of various travelers who were traveling through India and they wrote their uh, experiences. And even there where they are talking about the distribution of uh, students in these colleges, you can see that it was not one particular uh, community that you know was uh, favored. In fact, if anything, the Shudras were almost always the highest number. Why? We are talking about 18th and beginning of 19th century. But remember, in the 10th century, it was 70% Shudras who were administering the lands of uh, Choras. And Choras were considered the first administration system that they brought, credited with that. So you really have all these things. Everybody learned, learned uh, in their mother tongue and they also such as Samskritam, whatever it needed what to know in order to be able to transact business. To look at some of the legal agreements of the administration, you will have the, there is a uh, legal agreement between two parties. The legal agreement will be predominantly in Tamil. There will be some phrases of Samskritam. Why? Because those are the phrases very precise. Because this is an agreement, you don't want to have any ambiguity. Tamil and Sanskritam were always made. So, why, when these they, they were, you know, essentially teaching, you know, Vedas plus the three, right? So, when somebody brought to Gurukul, they brought them and they were dating, if it was if you are creating fabrics, you would bring some fabric. Farmer, wheat, jaw. However, that was how these gurukuls, acharyas and the gurukuls were paid in. It was never a matter of being paid in. So it was a completely voluntary system. How to run these gurukuls and they did all the other things. And, and this was a system it it was self contained it could be wanted and this is how the teachers were called brahmins here people who taught others were brahmins and there is there are so many examples in where you can go back and see that you know he was born into a brahmin family that anybody who acquired knowledge and, and because they never had any land and they were upon the produce parents who brought them there, when Macaulay came and completely collapsed them and imposed the English language, people who had lands, of course, they weren't in Gurukuls anymore, but at least they had to fall back on. The children could go back to wherever they are learn the trades of their parents in living. But what about the teacher? What means? Where was he going to get the in the next day? Now, what did the teacher have? The teacher was in He could learn things quickly. So when they introduced the English language, it was the because they had nothing else to do, nothing else to fall back on. Somebody comes and says that, look, any other way of supporting me or my family, do something to live. Started learning English and because they were, they were quick to understand these things, they had a certain efficiency. And therefore, when it became more normalized, meaning like they had all system and, you know, law and order and found that Brahmins were more or less dominating. Now, what happened was, remember, the different communities used to bring their students. Now, they were all back in their things. What happened was, now, who were the people who were setting law and order? At least 
it was the Brahmins. This is where going wrong. The landowners who are not Brahmins, the fact that somebody who they know is now coming and telling them the law, telling them if they did not pay the taxes. And unfortunately or fortunately, in Tamil Nadu and other places. This was the reason why this Brahmin was started. People, till yesterday I used to come and feed you, today you are wrong, how dare you. So this is the, okay, from there we have seen that people are having this animosity, things became bigger and bigger, the Brahmin was to jump into the freedom movement. They did that was because they felt it was time to go because they could also see of power how the white man else remember they could understand what the white man was and the white man tried to counter this by going to people who are not brahmins and saying look what are you guys doing all the jobs i'm going to allocate you some job Why find somebody who can occupy this so happened at that time right there were even instances where jobs could not be filled and and there was a they left open they said whenever we have some actually fill these jobs we will come and fill them until then meaning like brahmins anyway so this situation happened quite a bit and it came in 1920 this was the they came to power also they were being funded by the British and they went up to Congress which was actually Annie Besant who started the home if I remember 1910 or 1915 something you know movement to sort of so all the people who understood ended up being Brahmin and again in to when there were situations where you had to choose the non-Brahmin Annie Besant used to choose mind perhaps she thought he was more qualified the resentment kept going. The party found that this was a tool with. And, and since the 1920s, people have been leaving because remember that Brahmins could never own land in India. Across India, wherever you find land holding, it is because maybe they had a special skill, a special art, they were practicing, they were so proficient in a particular art that the king came and bestowed them land. Or like I said in the 10th century, Rajendra Sora established this Vedic college and for, for those people who were the teachers and the people who lived in that village, he made taxes free and he made sure that they had enough land to cultivate the proceeds off of which they could uh, continue to live and, and you know thrive and so on and so forth. So, Brahmins to the largest extent that I know of, don't have property, landed property. And therefore, they did not have to go and toil in the soil. When the sun doesn't beat on your skin, the skin doesn't darken. It is just a matter of pigmentation. right? So if you think about this and put it over hundreds of years, you see that most Brahmins are fair-skinned. And this was also held up against them, saying that, oh, you are an Aryan, you came not from here, that's why you are fair-skinned. That's not true. There are many Brahmins who are very, very dark because they happen to be farmers. They happen to go and till their land. They spend their time in the sun. You will get dark. In fact, you know, my family, a lot of us are very dark. It's just the fact that whether you spend time on the farms or when you, you spend time in, you know, homes or in patasalas, that is how your skin tone changed. So, Whatever it is, this is how things have gotten worse and worse. And even inside the Congress, there used to be a Brahmin versus anti-Brahmin section. And, and that is also considered one of the reasons why Rajaji quit Congress in Tamil Nadu to start Swatantra Party, where he felt that people who wanted to think, Swatantra was more like uh, conservatives in uh, Britain or the Republican Party in the United States. More right-wing, if you, if you want to think, for a lack of a better word. More capitalistic, I should say. Right? So, all these things have now come to a full circle and now we are seeing that the hatred is not just stopping with the Brahmins. Brahmins are not fighting back. 
there are some exceptions who are fighting back. Dr. Swami is one. But to me, he is more of a Kshatriya than a Brahmin. Like I consider myself more of a Kshatriya than a Brahmin because I'm fighting. I'm fighting this cause, I'm fighting that cause. I may not be using swords, but I am fighting this cause and that cause. And, and it's the Gurus that is you know saying all these things. Why I'm saying all this is, this is the reason why there is so much hatred for the Brahmin in Tamil Nadu. And it's continuing even today, you will start seeing that suddenly they'll go to some small pockets where Brahmins live still, like Mailapur, for example, in Chennai. And, and, and these goons of Dravida party, Dravida Karaham, and DMK has a lot of surrogates who will get them to do all the dirty deeds so that they can keep their hands and nose clean. They'll go and find somebody who is wearing a sacred thread. They'll cut it and say, ah, look, I punished this Papan. The thing is, sacred thread is a must for everybody. Go back to the pictures in 18th century, 19th century. Everybody wore a sacred thread. Sacred thread was not for this purpose. It's a different matter that as India modernized, one of the first things they discarded was the sacred thread. The second thing perhaps was the English crop. That is the way you and I are now, uh, you know, setting out. Before that, people used to shave their head and just have the uh, tiki at the end. That was how they used to have. Everyone, it's not one community, guys. So it's time now for all Sanatanis to start thinking as a Sanatani, not as a Brahmin, as a Vaishya or a, a Kshatriya or a Shudra. Those days are gone. We have to understand first how things were. And I urge all of you to read this book. It's available in many places. Tamil Nadu, The Land of Vedas by Dr. R. Nagaswamy, because all the research is primary. Primary research is what you want to go and quote. When you quote from somebody who has actually gone to the Kalvet, Kalvet is the stone inscriptions. Kalvet is a Tamil word for stone inscriptions. And he has interpreted that and he's presenting it to you. That means that is how things were at that point of time. Thanks for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to click on the bell button for notifications. Namaskar.